Hey, welcome back to the Armchair Architects as part of the Azure Enablement Show. Last time we were talking about data and how it's changing, and we realized there's more to be said there. So let's dive back into that conversation. Hey, so you're probably aware that we're back again with Uli and Eric. And not only back again, we're back into the same conversation because as soon as we finished recording the other one, we realized, gosh, that was a really important point that we didn't dive into, um, especially for people who are sort of early in career. So I'm going to bring us back to a conversational point that we had in which we were talking about the difference between um, synchronous um, processing and real-time processing, um, especially when it comes to data. And I would love it if if one of the two of you would give an example of each so we can easily differentiate. Um, it looks like, Will, you're ready with an example. Why don't you, why don't you well, do that? <clears throat> I'm going to help with that. Let me, let me call, do a little bit different. Instead of starting with an example, which I will sprinkle into the conversation, let me talk about a term okay. that I heard the first time in 1992 or three, something like that. Um, where a person that I ended up working for later, Norm Judah, stood up on stage and I was listening as a young young fellow and I, like big eyes and like, oh my God, a, a god is on stage and talking about stuff. Uh, very cool. And uh, he introduced a term called real enough time. And I was like, what does that mean? And so uh, he went into a number of examples. And I think I've re referenced this before in terms of what when architectures go wrong, um, where they effectively go and solve a, introduce a very complex technical solution to a very simple business solution. Um, and the idea here is if you do real enough time, that means you're really looking at the best point in time based upon the business scenario of how to capture um, and execute stuff. The example I used was instead of doing a two-phase commit with a mainframe, and a uh, SQL Server database, uh, this business requirement would have been perfectly served with a file upload and a processing every 24 hours. And so the team put themselves under extreme technology pressure uh, and the systems because they, they interpreted it as, no, it needs to be in real time and therefore two-phase commit and all these other good things. Whereas the business owner said, 24 hours, good enough. Um, if it's synchronized. And that's the big meaning of real enough time. And that's where um, I always start with, uh, think about the later you can process, the easier it is on your systems, the more insights you can generate to come back to the uh, previous episodes. Whereas the hotter you make it, the smaller the scope is you have, and therefore the data that you have is far less and far less accurate far less contextualized and all these other things we talked about. And therefore, you need to be careful uh, when you go and go into closer. Now, let's bring it back to the real-time conversation and synchronous, which you started with, David. Yeah. Um, a lot of times when people hear real-time, they think they need to make sure that the other system uh, that they're talking to uh, gets into uh, the data gets immediately uh, stored. Uh, they might actually want to do transactions across the system, like two-phase commit, which is the worst thing you can do for scalability. Uh, there are scenarios where two-phase commit does make sense, but it's very rare, and it certainly kills scalability. You can kiss your scalability for uh, goodbye right. um, when you do that. But what most systems don't realize is once you go synchronized and you hold the locks on the other side, the system has to grow bigger, uh, it is much more complicated and so forth. Um, and when you do that, you also have to really think about you creating almost one system out of the system that calls and the system that responds. You create a single system. And updating those will now become a real complex environment because the calls happen all the time. Uh, it's very, very uh, stateful and those kind of things. And therefore, we want people to think about, hey, A, think real enough time. Do you really need to be this close to the processing and make sure that it happens like this? Or is it okay to uh, go and stretch out the thing? I'll give you another example. Yeah. Um, if you go into e-commerce, for example, you, David, filling up your shopping basket right. um, is, for example, something that the business transaction systems that ultimately record you buying things doesn't need to know about yet. I don't need to lock inventory for you as long as I can figure out a way to uh, service your uh, request in a reasonable amount of time. So it's perfectly okay. 
good systems actually take your shopping basket and treat that as a completely isolated system. It has nothing to do with a record keeping system where sales are recorded, the inventory is uh, deprecated and stuff like that. Completely isolated. And when you are gone, we said, yes, I buy. Then there's a batch process that, or an asynchronous process to use modern language um, to effectively guzz. And then I'm going to process your uh, right. shopping basket and Commit so forth. The inventory at that point. Correct. Mm -hmm. And that way you split the system. You have, you have a real time system, which is the shopping basket where you interact with, but it's a very isolated system. And then you have the, uh, big system that manages inventory orders, uh, fulfillment, those kind of things, which at their own leisure and pace uh, process your shopping basket as soon as you say buy. Um, and that's smart design. That's how you scale. Because if you if you would, for example, do, don't do that and saying, hey, I'm going to create a shopping basket that goes into the inventory system and locks yeah. the inventory. And right. then David, after an hour of browsing, and putting things into the chopping basket back and forth decides not to buy. So you locked the entire inventory that David was looking at uh, for an hour. That's obviously bad business design and it's absolutely terrible systems design. And yep. so that's really the danger when you think synchronous and real time um, and in equate that instead of saying, how do I isolate the system? How do I partition the system? How do I buy myself time so that at the end of the day, I don't need that many resources uh, to process David's shopping basket because I have a very small shopping basket. I can deal with that separately. Once the shopping basket is done, it's a persistable data set. I can put it into a queue. I can then go and process it at leisure. And all good systems design do it that way uh, because they give you, you book hope at the end of the day. If, for example, you buy a, an e-ticket for a flight, they really right. don't lock the inventory in the seat mm -hmm. for you. Uh, they That's will right. say, hey, probability 99% is that I will get that seat. And therefore, I will tell David, yes, you got the seat. Um, and then if I can't get it, well, sorry, I'll get another one for you and I'd apologize to you. <laughs> so, so Eric, David, Eric, I think we're going to go right. You're, are you going to go in the direction of tightly coupled versus loosely coupled? Is that... I, I, Y yes, actually. So, so I wanted to kind of wrap this up with some do's and don'ts for our, our, our new architects out there and some folks yeah, that might not have worked cool. in the space for a while. So the, the don'ts are don't create what I call a distributed monolith. We described it. If you take two systems and you synchronize their transaction processing, you basically have created a monolith that is inflexible. It's just distributed, which can actually be perform more poorly than a giant monolith altogether. And we know today that there are challenges with monoliths. Microservices are the preferred approach. Asynchronous processing is a preferred approach. Uh, the, the, the second do or don't is never ask, do you need this in real time? Because the answer is always going to be yes. It's like asking, should I delete this file? The answer is always going to be no, don't delete it. So right. every, every uh, business person or person that's in charge of requirements says, I need this real time. I need this, you know, as it happens. Uh, but as Uli said, I had, the, I had the pleasure of working with Norm in my career too. Uh, Norm said, you know, how real is real, right? It's real enough for you. If, if it's five seconds, if it's 10 minutes, they're like, oh yeah, 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 10 minutes is fine. So go through that conversation to really feel out how much uh, real time actually is. And then there's two concepts uh, that we need to have emerge. Do create real-time stream analytics, which is not necessarily transaction processing on the event, but it's looking at just opening a window into the stream, uh, like in the highway yeah. example, and saying, what's, what's, what's flying by right now? And what right. can I tell from what's flying by? That is completely different than processing in real time, which is going to lead to that distributed monolith problem. Uh, and that, I think, is really where uh, folks that might be stepping into architecture for the first time may not have the scars that Uli and I have in dealing with these distributed monoliths. Transaction processing in real time hopefully will be fast, uh, but eventually you need eventual consistency in that model because mo all sorts of things have to happen. Right. Architectural paradigms like CQRS and the ambassador pattern, the orchestrator pattern are designed to help with that. So focus on that if you have to do something with a message, not just see what's happening with a message. 
Okay, I think we've done a great job of sort of, uh, I'm going to say dropping knowledge, but that sounds like something a little too uh, forced, as the kids would say. Um, but you did you did leave off with a number of patterns I think are really cool, and I, I encourage people to go visit their, their favorite uh, web search portal uh, to go, go check those things out. Um, and with that, I think what I'm going to do is uh, thank you, Uli, and thank you, Eric, and thank you all for watching. And I hope you'll join us next time on the Azure Enablement Show. Mm -hmm.